I am pleased to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Bob Bender. So Bob is an expert in software testing. Um, Bob's actually been at Cerner here for a few weeks working with us. So we've been very lucky to have him here with us, and we're really happy that uh, he's giving the talk here today. Um, Bob, like I said, he's an expert in uh, software testing. He's written uh, uh, several books and papers on the topic. Um, he's spoken at Google, I believe, at least twice that I've seen. Um, he's worked with Microsoft before, um, helping them uh, uh, test all of their server-side APIs. And so Bob is here today to talk about model-driven development and uh, share with us uh, what he knows about that. So please uh, join me in giving a warm welcome to Bob. So thank you very much for that, uh, Kevin. Uh, before I get started, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Chuck Schneider, uh, who originally invited me to come and give this talk, and uh, uh, Kevin as well, and the rest of the people here at Cerner, and all of you for showing up today to hear this. Uh, it's really quite a treat to do this, so I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Um, I also want to thank Kevin, by the way, for uh, sort of indirectly or really directly proposing the subject matter of this talk. Uh, I was thinking more about something along the lines of uh, a kind of uh, a discussion of uh, something related to testing, and Kevin asked me to do a demo of a model-based testing tool. Now, doing demos is risky business, so I usually try to stay away from that, but uh, I have one set up, teed up today, and, and I hope uh, uh, it, it goes off well. I think it will. So, uh, also, uh, uh, my uh, my friends here and colleagues here at About Objects uh, were instrumental in doing this. Uh, Leroy Mattingly uh, helped to get that going, and we've had a lot of interesting discussions with uh, the rest of the team about uh, testing and uh, development on all of the uh, interesting platforms that are, are being worked on today. So this. Um, uh, what I want to talk about today uh, really has to do with uh, model-driven development and uh, testing. I want to start out with a little bit of an explanation to kind of set the stage on this as to why testing is important and what it means. It's not easy. It's about bug hunting, and I'll try to suggest quickly uh, why that is actually harder than it might seem at first. Uh, just to kind of level set, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the ideas that are uh, commonly used in the Agile approach for testing behavior-driven development, uh, acceptance test-driven development, and then uh, we'll have a little fun with something I call the attack of the uh, back blob. That's not a typo. Uh, we'll talk about model-based testing, and this will be the main focus of the presentation, uh, test models, and I'll give you a demo of a tool called Spec Explorer. Uh, this is a product I happen to have worked with a lot. Uh, there are a number of model-based testing systems. Uh, this is just one of them. And we'll talk, kind of use that to uh, sort of uh, give uh, some concrete form to the idea of model-based testing. Then we'll wrap up and kind of talk a little bit about model-driven development and to try to answer some of the questions that I, I'm going to pose to you in just a moment. We'll also revisit the blob. Ah, here's the Grand Canyon, wind whistling through it. I have in my hand a grain of sand. Grain of sand. Here's a question, first pop-up question. How many grains of sand will it take to fill the Grand Canyon? This size. Order of magnitude would be fine. Trillions, okay. Two to the hundred thousand. It's a large number. All right. If you don't want to play along, you can kind of just enjoy the, uh, uh, the image there. I, I apologize. PowerPoint is not cooperating with me, so I'm not sure what. There it is. All right. Well, all right. So two to the hundred thousands, I think, was, was probably the biggest. The, the, there are some estimates on this, and the number is on the order of about 10 septillion. That's a big number. Uh, so what does this have to do with testing, and what the heck is a subdomain anyway? I'm going to give you just a little bit of testing theory, and uh, th that'll be all the testing theory we'll talk about today. Suppose we take a trivial program. We'd like to find uh, where are all the places that a trivial program or even a large program can go wrong. Well, in any piece of software, uh, one bit uh, in the wrong state uh, is sufficient to cause even a catastrophic failure. 
This is one of the sort of quirky properties of software that things that are seemingly minuscule uh, failures uh, can have uh, very uh, significant effects. And so if we have a trivial program, we kind of look at both the data state as well as the execution space. The execution space is basically the set of paths or sequences that, through the code that you can take. And as you start to look at moderately complex programs, this gets to be very big. So the execution space of this rather trivial program, it's only about you know, a string of 10 characters for a data space, and uh, not, not really complex uh, piece of code by a typical production code standards, it's just a ridiculous number. Uh, I'll spare you the, the kind of uh, explorations on this, but you can see that it's about uh, several, hundreds, several hundreds of orders of magnitude bigger than the number of grains of sand that it will take to fill the Grand Canyon. So we're looking for that elusive single bit <laughs> out of this ridiculous collection of bits that uh, is going to cause our programs to do something we don't want them to do. It seems hopeless, right? Well, actually, there's this idea that the uh, theoreticians call revealing subdomains, and it turns out that there's a certain amount of regularity uh, in software. And it's basically that the idea is this, that uh, there are large subsets of this astronomically huge uh, space that basically are what are called revealing. And that means that if a bug exists in a member of that space, then uh, it's sufficient that if we uh, reach that, uh, that will trigger an observable instance uh, of the failure related to that bug. So basically, there's a certain amount of regularity and structure in software that saves us from this kind of huge problem. But the problem is still large, very large, nonetheless. And the interesting thing about software testing is, well, if we knew where the bugs were to begin with, we wouldn't have to test. But of course, we don't. And so we have this huge, huge number of places to look. And uh, all we have to go on really are guesses. So what we'd like to do in testing, and the whole strategy of testing, is trying to find guesses that are good. Right, so that's all the testing theory. Now a little bit of reality. How many bugs are out there? Uh, I, there this has been studied in lots of ways. I, I'm going to give you some numbers that are fairly recent uh, in this. Uh, in the aerospace, uh, the average for this, this particular study uh, is about a little bit less than one bug per thousand lines of code. This is released, uh, released uh, software, not uh, pre-release. For FDA class two systems, uh, in this particular study found it was closer to two. Uh, for information technology systems, the average is closer to four. Uh, for mobile apps, it was about six. And then bad software you know, gets much larger. And there are actually are studies, the numbers are, are really pretty catastrophic. I'm sure you probably all, if you've been in the business long enough, you've run into a few of these, or you may have been actually users of them. So it's, it's not uh, com completely out of the question. But so that's, that's the number of a kind of, and, and so the question is now, how many of these kinds of bugs are, are actually going to be found in the typical piece of software that we're working on? Uh, if you just do the math, and this is a, a fairly simple uh, extrapolation, I don't, I don't claim this is a, actually a very good model, but it's one that I, I think is, it, at least gets the point across. If we have a system that's about a half million lines of code, and that's really, by today's standards, not a very large system, uh, we can expect, depending on our, our software, quality, software quality process, somewhere from about 400 to 3,000 bugs in that system. And that's if you're doing a good job. Uh, if it's a million lines of code, well, you do the math, and you can see that it's more. And then if you have a 50 million line, line of code system, uh, depending on what your software quality processes are, you can do the math and you end up with 30,000 bugs. And actually, in my experience, these numbers are not really uh, unusual. So there it is, and that's kind of the motivation. So what we're looking for in testing is something that's going to help us find these bugs faster. Cer certainly none of you who are, uh, most of the people in this audience are professional software developers. You don't wake up in the morning and think, ah, today I'm going to... Uh, put as many bugs as I possibly can into the software and, and make it fail in interesting ways. That's what testers think of in the morning when they get up, uh, but uh, that's another story. So we have kind of this first problem is how many and how to find them. So one uh, uh, take on this is, and it's uh, used uh, quite a bit in uh, uh, agile development, 
is something called behavior-driven development and acceptance test-driven development. I borrowed this slide from a, a fellow called uh, Nikolai uh, Vasilev. Uh, I thought it was a reasonably good and succinct way of, of explaining what BDD is. Uh, essentially, it's a kind of collaborative process where you try to isolate the things that you want your system to do in the, the form of stories, which are then translated into behaviors, and we'll see what the form of that is in just a moment, and then uh, somebody looks at those and essentially creates software from that. Uh, most of you in this audience are fami very familiar with this process, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. The acceptance test-driven development cycle kind of works like this. It says, do this stuff on the left and then write tests based on your understanding of these behaviors. But we follow or attempt to follow uh, the idea that uh, we should uh, uh, define what an acceptance test result is first, establish that, run it against the system, see that it fails, and then provide the implementation that causes it to work correctly. And then we iterate on that until uh, we get to some point where we're relatively happier. At least all of our acceptance tests have passed. Something to ask yourself is, when I'm doing that, how many of those bugs, uh, in, in enough of them perhaps to not quite to fill uh, the Grand Canyon uh, with grains of salt, but how many of them do you think you found? And where does your software process kind of fit in relative to those others? And kind of the ranking from, you know, moderately effective to very effective. We'll come back and answer that question in a, in a bit, but uh, I wanted to now just kind of introduce you to uh, something entirely different. This is an example that I'll use throughout this, and I'll, we'll see how this, this fits in in just a moment. The chat server. So there's this simple, very simplified form of a chat server. Uh, we have um, a server which responds to messages from some arbitrary number of users, client endpoints, and th what the users can do is to log on. Uh, list the active users, other active users in the chat server, post a message to be broadcast, receive a broadcast message from others, and then log off. So it's a simple system. We'll talk about, use this as an example. Now, if we were doing behavior-driven development, agile development, we'd start out by saying, how does this work? Well, you find the users and you say, tell me a story about what you want to do. And a story is kind of a shorthand form of uh, sort of a... a uh, uh, a need uh, for software or a system in, in context. So here a feature is log on, and this might be that in order to use the uh, chat server uh, as a validated chat server uh, uh, process or user, I want to submit my credentials and establish a session. Now, uh, once I've established a session, there are sort of flavors of that, variations on that, and scenarios. And here's the first one, submit good credentials. So uh, kind of obviously what happens here is that you uh, enter a user ID and password, and you get logged in, as long as it's good. And you get some kind of response or acknowledgement from that. You could likewise submit invalid credentials and get a similar response for that. Now, these uh, uh, keywords in blue are taken from a behavior-driven development testing tool called SpecFlow, which works in the uh, uh, Microsoft world. There are plenty of tools that support this. I know that, uh, for example, here at Cerner, you use JBehave and, and possibly others uh, which uh, support this kind of uh, definition. And the, the idea of the then parts of this is that these provide validation criteria. So from this, we're going to take and try to then produce a test case. So the, the essence of this, and I'm, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, the essence is that we take this kind of markup of text and then produce tests from it. Now, what happens when we do that? So we write tests, and we write tests, and we more tests, and more tests. And there are, uh, within this, there's a certain amount of time that we have as testers and developers, whether it's uh, the developers are doing the testing, or whether you have testers, or kind of you're working in concert, uh, there's a fixed amount of capacity. There's a fixed amount of hours in the day. There's a fixed amount of brain cells in your mind to do this kind of stuff, and it doesn't expand you know, it, forever. So you start out, perhaps, in the first sprint, and you look at what you have to do. You say, oh, yeah, we've got plenty of people to do all that, and I can cover this whole thing. And then, uh, at the next iteration, you have some new set of functionality to include, wrap into that. And then you say, well, what am I going to do? Well, you'll probably work on and then incrementally over these other releases or sprints, uh, adding in the amount of uh, tests that you have the capacity to do. And that's typically kind of fixed. Well, what happens? You end up with 
a backlog, or what I'm going to see in a moment, why I call it a backlog, of test cases, manual test cases in particular, that are not executed. And these are often the acceptance tests of the kind that we, we mentioned just a moment ago. Uh, people will say, well, obviously, the solution to all of that is to automate your tests. Well, it is and it isn't. It certainly helps. Uh, but then you start to have a large body, a repository of automated test cases, which now must be maintained. They have to be changed. They have to be tweaked. Perhaps the requirements change and so on. So you now have, as you go along, uh, this increasing, uh, lar increasingly large number of uh, test items to execute, maintain, and do something with. And this is what I call a blob. All right. That's the attack of the test back blob. So what happens is we start to accumulate larger and larger collections of tests is that the, you know, they start to have, uh, they take on a life of their own, and in some cases they can be somewhat consuming. They seem to be a sink of, of energy and effort rather than uh, accomplishing something that you might uh, think is productive. So this is a problem in testing. So just, just to recap, uh, I've tried to dramatize sort of two essential problems in testing. Uh, one is that there's a lot of things to test. We don't know necessarily which tests are going to do their, serve their purpose, which is to find bugs. Uh, so we tend to write more and more tests, but then we have this problem that we have lots of tests. So uh, how can we deal with that? I'm going to postpone trying to answer that question. I will get to it, but not just uh, for the moment. Let's now kind of switch gears and talk about modeling. So what's a model? Well, model is one of these terms which is much overloaded. Uh, I'm going to focus on a sense of model in this talk, which basically is a, it provides a way of focusing in on a particular aspect of a system uh, to achieve a particular kind of result. It supports a purpose. So if you've seen an architectural model of a, of a, uh, a building or a campus, you know, it's about uh, this big, and it's, uh, it gives you a sense of what things are going to look like in three dimensions. In IT systems, we're usually interested in models of behavior and what they contain, sort of what they're going to do and some of the information and its relationships. In testing, uh, we produce models that focus on aspects of a system under test that support our testing goals. That usually means behavior over sequence in time, and it usually means we're going to focus on transformation of input and output. We're also interested in verification because we want to know uh, whether the system has produced a response to a test that's accurate. This can be surprisingly difficult to do. Then we want to know coverage. Have we tried all, looked in all the places that we think we should look? And what about risk management, especially in uh, larger systems uh, that have uh, some kind of safety critical aspect to them? We certainly want to be sure that we address the uh, kinds of failure modes that could lead to uh, uh, severe uh, uh, consequences. By the way, these two uh, diagrams are from a uh, uh, Escher, the uh, Dutch uh, uh, graphic artist of the 20th century, and kind of do a nice job of sort of representing this uh, focus. Uh, let's see what we can do about uh, producing a test model for a simple program. So here's a simple program, the system under test. It provides a feature to do a log on, a log off, and get status. The get status is simply uh, returns a number that's a count of the number of the uh, times it's been called. Uh, log on is first, uh, kind of, uh, it can't be repeated uh, once it's been done for a particular session. Uh, and then log off has to be the last thing we do. So here's a very simple program. Now, how would we go about uh, testing this? Well, let's devise a test model. Instead of perhaps uh, writing uh, the uh, uh, given when then, let's, let's think about how we might design another piece of software to actually achieve this. We'd start out with saying, I'd start out, there are many ways to do this, but here's one sample of it, by saying, well, we want to count uh, that the number of calls reported back is accurate. So we'll start out by saying number of calls should be zero. I then want to issue a logon message. And then I'm going to do an assert, I'm going to check that the response is accurate. And in this, I've made an assumption that we're getting responses back similar to most RFC protocols. So 200 response code means everything's fine. I'd then like to increase the value of the counter and do the get status again. And then I would expect that I get a good response, and then uh, I assert uh, that that counter is the same. Then I want to repeat this, and then try a log off. 
Well, so that kind of covers all the operations. Let me ask you, am I done? Is this an adequate set of tests? Why not? What else should I do? Try the failure? Other, other paths? OK. So one thing we could do uh, is that uh, we're not, uh, there, there's no requirement that I have to use the get status before I log off. So I could just basically take that path and skip it altogether. That should work. Uh, what if I try to log on twice? Well, uh, that probably should be rejected, uh, and we should catch uh, that rejection. That's not a bad behavior. It's not an incorrect one, but it's, it's one that we would expect. Likewise, if I haven't logged on and I attempt to do get status, uh, I should get an error. Uh, likewise, if I try to log off before I've logged on, that shouldn't work either. So now we have a test model. So now I can start devising tests, right? So it's, it's fairly simple. This is actually kind of like a flow chart, and it's, it's fairly simple to write a piece of software that does this or to exercise this, uh, go through this as a procedure for yourself. But we can do a lot more with models than just that, because if we construct models uh, with a little bit of foresight, it turns out that we can generate not just one set of tests, but quite a few. So let's return now to the chat server example. So here's a chat server. Uh, we'll take a look at one message sequence. So here's the login from user A. He gets his acknowledgment back. Uh, user B logs in and gets an acknowledgment back. Uh, user B then asks the server, tell me who else is logged on, and gets the answer U and B, or U and A. Uh, a then asks the same question and should get the same answer, A and B. Uh, user A then says, you know, uh, I'm going to post a, a message uh, with a, a nice picture of my pumpkin latte, because I'm sure everybody in the world is interested in that. <laughs> we get an acknowledgment back, and uh, uh, well, it works fine. And then uh, the broadcast message goes out uh, to user B and to all others, basically uh, telling everyone else that uh, you think that the pumpkin latte is, is wonderful. Uh, user B says, uh, I've heard enough about pumpkin lattes today, and I'm logging off. All right, so that's one, basically, path through this. How many sequences like this are possible? A lot. <laughs> I think that's a reasonable answer. It's a very large number. So now the question becomes, OK, this, this is one test. Now, how might, might I go about trying to cover some of those tests and answering the, the question, well, what are all those a lot tests? Can I use my model to good effect in helping me answer that question? Well, uh, let's, let's find out. Uh, I'm going to give you a demo now of a tool called Spec Explorer uh, and using the chat system. Uh, Spec Explorer is a model-based testing tool. It was originally developed at Microsoft Research about uh, six, seven years ago. Uh, it was then uh, used, it's an interesting story in itself how that came to pass, uh, B. It was used to test all of Microsoft's server-side APIs. There's about 500 very complex programs, including uh, something called SMB2, which is essentially the Microsoft File Management System. It's been extensively used, it's robust and stable, uh, it's actually free uh, if you have Visual Studio. Visual Studio is not free. Uh, models are expressed not in cartoons, what I call cartoons, or UML diagrams. So if you, you may be used to modeling or have heard about modeling using pictures or, or graphic forms of one kind or another, uh, Spec Explorer uses C-sharp code for its models. And what it does at the end of the day is to generate a standalone executable test suite. So I will say, by the way, there are quite a few different uh, model-based testing tools. Uh, there are a number of commercial products. And uh, there are uh, about a dozen uh, open source tools. And they, they work in uh, a number of different languages. I've chosen this one today not to emphasize that it's necessarily better or worse than others. Uh, they're all kind of different and take different uh, paths to this. But it's one that I'm familiar with, so I thought I could uh, uh, do uh, 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 Kevin's uh, request without uh, making a total fool out of myself. 
So I'm going to sit down now because I need to step up to the console of the mighty world, sir. <clears throat> we'll see if we can do a demo. Caps off. All right. So there is uh, Visual Studio uh, ready to go. Uh, for, for those of you who might not be work, have worked in or, or like working in the Microsoft world, um, again, this is, uh, this is what uh, the Visual Studio IDE looks like. Uh, if you're, you're not um, a Microsoft developer, uh, you, know, you can uh, think of this as kind of a cross-cultural experience. Uh, I, I will say that uh, you know, there are model-based testing tools and model-based solutions uh, in most other uh, kinds of stacks and programming languages. So I don't mean to exclude any particular uh, type of development environment. So let's uh, first of all open up the uh, chat solution. All right, there it is. And when you install, if you are familiar with Visual Studio, you'll notice there's something a little bit different here about your top level menu. When you install Spec Explorer, uh, it, it basically adds this menu choice here. So We've opened this up, and now the solution uh, that has previously been developed is one that contains a Spec Explorer model. So let's take a look at what the model consists of. There are two main parts to the model, something that's uh, for historical reasons called a chord file, uh, and then there's the model itself, and the model is in C-sharp code. So let's dry, dive into this and take a look at uh, what the model actually looks like. Let's start with um, one of the things we can do because this is fully code is that uh, we can record state. Now, and state is not the state of the system under test, it's the state of our test model. So here we have an enumeration of what the user can be doing. This is pretty self-explanatory. And then we have uh, a uh, partial definition of the class uh, which represents a user. We are going to instantiate multiple user objects from this as we go through the testing. So that's why we have a class for this, as opposed to just a single user instance. Gives us a lot of flexibility. All right, and we have a mapping, by the way, of uh, mapping from logged on users to their data. That means what kinds of messages they've received. Uh, that's important because one of the requirements of this system was that we receive uh, messages in order. So if uh, I, I posted a picture about my pumpkin latte followed by my uh, uh, you know, decaf pumpkin latte, uh, picture of that. I want, want to be sure that everybody sees the pumpkin latte first. All right. Now, we have uh, Spec Explorer annotates uh, model components in brackets with certain keywords. And this is one which uh, shows what's called the accepting state condition. Essentially, this, this uh, condition is, is a Boolean. It returns a Boolean when it's queried. Uh, that will explain to you or determine whether or not you, you're done with your test. So we, we have a certain kind of situation that we want to define as, as having our test being done. And this is that all users are essentially uh, are not waiting for any deliveries and uh, uh, there is no user that's logged on. So in other words, we've basically uh, completed all the possible ac actions we may have started. So we have other uh, kind of uh, helper or convenience methods on, on this. Uh, I think these are, are uh, probably pretty self-explanatory. Let's go into some of the uh, what are called rule methods, which allow us to now model the behavior uh, that we're interested in our, in our system. So here's two uh, model, part of the parts of the model who are called rules for logon request. And this, this says uh, for any given user, uh, I have a precondition which requires that in order to perform a logon request, uh, the user isn't already logged on. That's kind of the shorthand version of this. Uh, so our user, uh, if that, that condition is met, then uh, we will revise our, our model and indicate that the, essentially that the user is logged on. We have another rule about the logon response, because as you recall, this was a, essentially is a protocol where we're sending a message and we're, we're waiting for a response. So the logon response rule is going to be enabled when, uh, for a particular user, uh, when uh, we've indicated that we have 
uh, added this user as someone who's logged on, or at least has a request, and that uh, we receive the uh, uh, user state uh, is no longer uh, wait, or the user uh, is in the state of waiting for a logon acknowledgement. Something else, a feature of Spec Explorer that I want to point out is that in this requires, we can actually trace requirements. So we can associate, for example, you see the, the red text there, user must receive response from logon request. So this is a, a requirement, the line item requirement, and it's identifier, uh, which can be traced uh, as the tests are executing. All right, so we have lots more rules. We have uh, kind of uh, similar rules for uh, log off requests. Let's uh, collapse that and look at uh, list. So we have the list function was one where we, we, we ask the server who else is logged on and we have similar kinds of uh, behavior modeled for this. Now the rule tags are kind of interesting and uh, what Spec Explorer does is, and we'll, I'll try to explain this in several ways, is it's, it's a bit of a slippery concept. Spec Explorer does not take this code, compile it, and run it. So it does not, this code does not get compiled and run. You think, well, you know, what, wh why would I write code that's never going to be compiled? Well, Spec Explorer is actually a, uh, a system which takes this code as a model, processes it, uh, to then generate tests and explorations. So this code will actually, it, it, it runs, but it doesn't run. It's, it's a kind of interesting uh, sort of combination of this. And the behavior that's then in that so-called exploration uh, of these requires is to act as a precondition. And so if this precondition turns out to be false, the rest of this method doesn't uh, get executed. It stops right there. So when you're doing an exploration, the way that essentially that the Spec Explorer works is to take the initial state, <coughs> for example, our initial state might be the user collection is empty, and then look at all the available rules and say which rules are enabled given that state. And then that becomes kind of the first step in the exploration. It then will take a next, the next step in the exploration and look at what uh, rules are enabled in that uh, given the data state, which has been updated according to our model. Uh, and then uh, execute that, and so forth, until it reaches an accepting state condition. And in the process of that exploration, we can then say, and we'll see how this happens in just a minute, we could say either, well, we're interested in doing that to be better understand our model and this behavior, or we're interested in doing that to automatically generate tests. So it can work in two ways. And along the way, we can kind of get coverage uh, of requirements. All right, so I'm not going to go into the rest of these rules unless you, you insist. We have a few helpers here. Here's a, a helper method that uh, helps us to format um, uh, our requirements, and uh, this is a wrapper around a, basically for uh, uh, compatibility purposes around a, another uh, Spec Explorer method. By the way, I, today my, my goal is just to introduce you to some of the principles of operation of this tool. Uh, this is not a tutorial. Uh, I'm not going to be able to explain to you how to use this, uh, just to kind of give you a, a very high-level flyby. So there will probably be a lot of things that might not make a whole lot of sense. We will have time for question and answer. Oh, yes. Okay, so that's, that's the first part of the model. So what we've done is to basically define the conditions under which the, the actions, uh, the behaviors of the system under test are enabled from our test model perspective. The other part of this is something called a chord, a chord file, and it looks like this. Uh, this is really kind of the heart of Spec Explorer and its models. Uh, I won't try to explain to you uh, all of the, the implications of all these things, but we're going to look at something called machines. And a machine is a, a very interesting concept in Spec Explorer. What it allows us to do is to define an abstract pattern of uh, sequences. So if I was interested in, for example, uh, I'd like to see the, basically the pattern where I log on, do a list, and then log off. What are all the possible scenarios for that? Well, this machine answers that question. I can basically compose a sequence of very specific uh, invocations of actions and methods, and then I can do things that kind of 
uh, provide a very succinct shorthand notion of other sequences. If you're familiar with regular expressions, you may recognize this. And essentially, or if you're not, what this means is that we do this, 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 so request, response, request, response. Then we do a list request. We do two of those. And then the expectation is uh, we'll do one more uh, log off request followed by either a log off request or error response. And then this will be done. The, the asterisk there indicates that that's repeated a certain number of times. The parentheses uh, perform grouping uh, it, pretty much, I think, as you would expect. So this is one particular scenario. Now, we can do lots of other scenarios. So if we were interested in evaluating whether or not broadcasts are, are being ordered properly, uh, we can do a similar kind of thing here. So here we can send some specific broadcasts, and then we can ask for a multiplicity of acknowledgments of those broadcast messages. So this is the post part of it. The broadcast act uh, looks then searches over all of the users to find whether or not all of the users uh, actually have, or all the users in our test model have received their broadcast in the correct sequence. All right, and something else, and this is a demo uh, so that uh, these things are, are essentially hard coded with, with data values. Spec Explorer has some very interesting and powerful features for parameterizing these methods so that you don't have to bind these to particular values you can essentially create a function which will generate these values at runtime according to other rules. So you can define uh, as much or as little complexity as you want in terms of data generation. It also has some other interesting uh, capabilities in terms of uh, combinational selection, uh, including uh, what's known as the pairwise uh, strategy. Uh, one other one that I can point out that's kind of fun, let's see. So this is a fairly simple looking machine. Well, what, what is it? What's this? It's not an exclusive or, or a logical or, excuse me. Uh, what this is a special kind of composition operator within a machine. And basically what it says is that we're going to take the model program. The model program is another machine, which uh, we can go up here. Uh, I kind of skipped over it earlier. But the model program basically says put everything in there, everything. So it's a model, basically the model program is all the behavior that we've modeled. Now, if I want to just take a slice out of this, one way that I can do that is to take this broadcast ordered scenario and then combine that, basically merge the model program machine with the broadcast machine. So I get this kind of interesting overlay. And the reason that that's handy is that I, I don't have to re, re I can define the model program behavior in its entirety once and then combine that with just about any other kind of scenario of interest. So this is a very powerful technique for expressing complex behavior as well as exploring it. All right, so again, two kind of key ideas here. One is, is rules that, that sort of define actions and responses. There's another kind of uh, rule is called an event, and uh, let's see if I can find my events in this. The events are defined elsewhere. Uh, let's take a look at what we can do with this. I can go to what's called the Solution Explorer, excuse me, the Exploration Manager. The Exploration Manager is a Spec Explorer feature, which essentially lists all of the machines that we've defined. So let's take a look at the uh, broadcast. Uh, uh, let's try uh, requirements coverage. Now, so if I select this machine and I ask Spec Explorer to explore it, what it's going to do is this. Let's take a look at it and see, and then try to uh, figure out what this means. So it's exploring the machine, three seconds, 38 states, 41 steps, six requirements. So this actually took advantage of some, some built-in features to uh, achieve requirement coverage as they're indicated in the model, and then produce this. Now, a little bit of um, 
Let's see if we can get in on this a little closer. Wrong way. Okay, so these uh, the circles are, correspond to states. These these are states of the test model, and so in state zero, this is kind of our initial situation. The first thing we're going to do is to start the server. Now these are strictly speaking not part of the the test, uh, the functionality test, but they're necessary to get things going. They're part of the setup. So we'll start the server, connect to it, and then we have Spec Explorer has found two interesting paths for us within the constraints of this particular machine. They both start with logon request. So this one goes logon request and then goes down through several broadcasts. And then it turns out that in this path, we, uh, from this, <coughs> we can now, <coughs> excuse me, from this we can now, uh, we can now expect several different sequences of events. So going down this path to the, the final accepting state, so 24, 27, 31, 34, is one sequence of events that uh, we would expect and is valid out of this. So we can test for that. Uh, we can also look to see that uh, there, are, there are two possibilities here uh, where depending on, because the ordering of messages, while it has to be ordered for a particular user, is not strictly uh, bound to interleaving, uh, it could be either one of these. So this machine, the machine requirements coverage, it basically asks to be sure that we have every requirement uh, hit once, not necessarily in the most compact way. Uh, and then on the other way, the other path, main path in this, we, we uh, do, we get three users logged on, and then we do a list request. Then we expect to see a list request that tells us that there are three users logged on, essentially. Let's take a look at uh, the uh, broadcast ordered slice. Now, let's explore that. The exploration is done. And by the way, these things are not pre uh, This is being done in real time. So it's taking the, the uh, uh, Spec Explorer model program, uh, consuming that through the exploration engine, and then producing this rendering uh, uh, as a result. So what's in this? Well, here uh, we're trying to do the uh, this is the ordered slice. We want to be sure we're checking is that some of the, the possibilities or all the possibilities we've modeled that ordering is correct. So here we have our, uh, this is our logon request. Uh, the, the diamonds are indicate what's called an event in Spec Explorer. That means we're, we're waiting on a response from the system under test uh, to see that it is done uh, as, as we expect or what it has done. Uh, we'll then proceed on with uh, additional logons and then uh, two broadcasts. Uh, we're looking for an event broadcast uh, from uh, user two. Uh, uh, the first uh, or broadcast uh, from user one, the first message from uh, user one. And there are several variations on this that are possible within uh, that, that configuration. Okay. Now, over here I list, there, there is a number of, uh, within a, the cord file, there are a number of parameters. One of those is called test enabled. And so for a given exploration, uh, do I want to generate tests? Oftentimes uh, the answer is no. So as you can see that actually test is not enabled for all these slices. Well, why would I want to do that without generating tests? I may want to use Spec Explorer. One of its, actually one of its uh, kind of powerful features is that once the model is created, you can start to use it to analyze the behavior of the system. So you can synthetically uh, generate these explorations. Sometimes explorations, as you, as you can imagine, can get to be quite large. One of the reasons that we have this ability to slice and also to limit the bounds of the exploration is so that it doesn't get to be a runaway. So let's take a look at the test suite uh, and let's do the uh, exploration on that. All right, so here's the test suite exploration. This is generated on the fly with the chat server. And essentially we have about 10 test cases. This is one, if I can kind of uh, get on this thing, oops. So you can see that this kind of looks similar. Uh, this fans out a little bit more on the, the broadcast side. This is a, we, 
we'll see the reason for this. I'll, I'll switch you back to the test, the test suite machine. Uh, the modeler decided that there was a certain kind of level of complexity that we wanted to interact with in this first test run. Now, in the next few test runs, we're, we're doing some, we have some slightly different purposes. Uh, it's perhaps a little bit hard to do, ferret these out by just looking at the explorations, but this is one uh, start to finish that gets us to the accepting state, and then so on for the rest. Now, what I can do, because these are test enabled, this is a test enabled exploration, is that right clicking on this machine brings up the things that I can do. I can explore, re explore, do on the fly testing, which is a very interesting capability I'm not going to talk about today. Uh, we can then generate test code. All right, so for those of you who have been, I don't know, how many of you here today have been writing JUnit tests? Or X unit? Yeah, okay, that's probably about two thirds of the room. All right, so now pay close attention. I'm going to generate the test code. Generated code is saved. All right, that's done. Now, let's go back to the Solution Explorer and see if I can find the generated test. And you can kind of see what this, and I'm not, I'm telling the truth here, it's not all just uh, baloney and magic and smoke and mirrors. These are the actual generated tests. So the comment here is, you know, uh, uh, no user serviceable parts. You ever get something in the past? Well, maybe maybe you don't, but it, this is a generated code. It is, it's readable in case you have to get into it and look at it, but it really isn't, is not intended for you to, to uh, maintain it at this level. So here's what it looks like, and uh, I'll just kind of uh, do a quick uh, kind of a sample of a few things of this. Uh, event metadata, uh, this is the initialization and cleanup. Uh, so we're, we're using some of it. Basically, this is building on the Visual Studio uh, test framework. Uh, and here is a region test at, with um, it's a region, it's a hider. So uh, this is in starting in test zero. So what we're going to do is begin test, and the test. This is all generated codes. So this is essentially logging. We're going to send a message to something called the chat adapter to tell it to start the server. Then we're going to ask the uh, to connect to the server, uh, and then send a logon request. Now. What we're doing is we expect events. Uh, the events are basically um, looking for, or rather, uh, we'll not go into the details of this, but uh, suffice it to say that this is where we look for a particular response, and then once having received that response, uh, we can evaluate whether it's, it's correct or not. We can then issue the next logon request, and so on and so forth. All right, so here is the rest of the automatically generated code. Uh, here are some uh, private methods that are, are basically helpers for this <coughs> that allow us to check the response uh, uh, of this. And I, this is all generated code, and it will vary depending on you know, the model that we have. All right, so now let's uh, get to the final uh, stage of this, the, uh, the grand finale. Uh, let's run all of our tests. So build is started, build succeeded. And if I get the test explorer, there it is. Okay, so we, we're generating. This actually has both the client and the server on the, the same computer. So we're just starting and stopping the servers, uh, firing up the TCP connections, sending messages back and forth. Uh, and there it is. Oh, and I apologize. Well, okay, I don't apologize. I left a bug, purposely left a bug in the code. That's not just a convenient expression. I'll show you where it is in a minute. So here, uh, our test suite it has failed. Let's take a look at what we, we, we can find out from having it failed. And if you've, you've used Visual Studio for testing, there's, there's nothing uh, exotic here. Uh, I'll just uh, show you this for kind of for the, uh, to get a sense of what it looks like. Uh, so this is standard Visual Studio testing stuff. Here's our output. Uh, this basically is a log of this particular test. And then here is the message. So why did this test fail? Well, we asserted that uh, we expected that we had essentially three uh, users logged on, uh, one user one, two, and three, and the actual uh, contents of the user state set was one and three. So therefore, this test failed. 
test that passed, we can look at that, test output, uh, do kind of the same stuff. So let's see if we can figure out why this test, particular test failed. In the server, this is a server program, which I guess you, you could call it a mock, but in this, this is actually the, the, the whole system. This is not, uh, strictly speaking, a mock. It is uh, the actual system under test. Um, conveniently, for demo, demo purposes, we have a toggleable bug. <laughs> so I left this set to true, and I was working on this this morning, and I forgot to set it back to false. So now I will reset this to false. So the bug will no longer be injected. Let's uh, save that and um, rebuild our solution. All right, now, in true red-green fashion, if I run my test suite, and the demo gods are smiling on me, they should all pass. All right, and so there it is. Okay, so that's kind of a, a very, at a very high level, a flyby of what model-based testing with, with Spec Explorer looks like. So we've taken a fairly simple system and modeled its behavior. Uh, we've used some state uh, in that model to help us uh, keep track of the things that we've done uh, against the, the system under test. We've then uh, generated a, a number of uh, test cases from that. And you've seen that even in this fairly simple system uh, that there are a lot of possibilities. And at Spec Explorer, actually, and the number of tests that we generated here in that entire test suite was probably, uh, I'd say, several hundred at least. I haven't uh, done the exact count, but it's, it's quite a few. And to kind of get back to this as to how were we able to do that, the real power of Spec Explorer is, is, is in the so-called machines and cord files, so that we have the ability to define sequences uh, abstractly and then let the, uh, the tool do the dirty work of figuring out all the paths and ways that we can exercise those. And then on top of that, it'll generate all the tests for that. Okay, so let me uh, get back to the uh, regularly scheduled program. All right, so to kind of recap on Spec Explorer, uh, Spec Explorer works on the idea of a model program being composed of what we call core declarations, uh, data structures, actions, and adapters. I didn't talk too much about the adapters. There are two ways to use Spec Explorer. One is that you can use it uh, basically and bind it to anything that's in the Visual Studio environment, right? So it can be any, any class file, any, any Visual Studio app, as long as you have access to its interface, you can drive tests. So it's, it's, it's certainly uh, possible to use this for a, a unit test. For adapters, the adapters can basically wrap any system anywhere. Any system anywhere. So uh, web service, uh, basically, as long as you can construct and run on, on, the, uh, on a Microsoft platform, or even not, I, I suppose, not completely necessary, uh, the adapter abstracts the behavior of the system under test and provides you with a, a wrapper around it so that it is uh, easy to manipulate within the model and that any of the grubby details that go along with it are kind of wrapped up and, and encapsulated in that. So adapters are actually a key part of this. They're not strictly speaking part of the model-based testing tool, but they're a very common uh, uh, part of the model. So adapters are key in that. Let me go back to this. Whoops. Wrong button. There we go. Okay. Actions. So actions have rules and events. We saw some rules. I didn't show you too many events, but events are essentially the way in which we uh, wait for a response from the system under test, whether it's a return from a program call or a message coming back from a remote server. Uh, and then look to see if it meets our criterion for that particular model state. So, machines define composable action sequences. Options control the exploration and data generation. Actions are explored, and exploration is again this rather, rather uh, very interesting 
uh, way of taking code and using it as a model as opposed to actually using it as code. There's a lot that goes on under the hood and under this. Uh, if you're interested in uh, uh, constraint solving systems, that's essentially what's happening here. And uh, Spec Explorer uses some very sophisticated stuff in that. So actions are explored. Uh, rules uh, define exploration conditions and events define expected responses. Data structures support this exploration. And as we mentioned, adapters basically are a way of keeping the model kind of clean. And exploration, which, which is achieved with all of this, is used for really two purposes. One is interactive model development, so that you can understand the behavior of your system without actually having to build it and understand it in a non-trivial manner. And then to generate test suites once you have the actual implementation so you can exercise it. So how do you use this? What's the workflow? Well, let's start out and assume somewhere you get an idea about the system you want to build, whether it's, it's through a for, sort of formal process, uh, an agile process or something other than that. And you as a developer uh, or as a tester devise a test model. You then explore the test model. What we found, and I've, I speak from many years of experience in this, is that doing this is sufficient to drive out lots and lots of problems. They're not bugs yet because you haven't implemented them, but you can find lots of interesting problems. You find ambiguous, missing, contradictory, incorrect, redundant, and incomplete requirements. Requirements bugs are generally the most expensive bugs to fix. Why? because they start early and they end late. The whole, by the way, the whole Agile process is kind of, uh, intends to get away from that of kind of making a, a big commitment up front and to try to do things in small increments, small steps so that you don't get into the trap of making a, a bad assumption and then finding that out much, much later. If you make a bad assumption, the idea is you find it out fairly soon. Uh, modeling for complex systems, you, but, but if you don't have a way of understanding complex behavior at system scope, uh, it's sometimes very hard to do that, especially if you're looking at uh, just kind of an acceptance or success-oriented criteria. So once you have the test model, you can then generate, let me back this up a little. Once the test model is done, you can then generate a test suite, as we just saw a moment ago. How long does that take? Well, it depends on the size of the test suite. On a bad day, it might be several minutes. That has inputs, test sequences, and expected results, something called a test oracle, not the oracle database. You can then run it. The test suite will automatically then control and observe the system under test and perform the evaluations, pass or fail. Pass or fail is actually very useful information. From that, we can get feedback on our model. I can guarantee you that models are never perfect. Models are, are something that takes, uh, takes work to develop and understand. Uh, and oftentimes when the system doesn't work as we expect, it doesn't necessarily mean that the system's wrong. It may mean that your model is wrong. It may also give you some clues as to that the, the requirements themselves are incorrect or inadequate in some way. Uh, of course, we can always find bugs uh, in the system under test by doing this kind of testing. When the tests pass, that's also useful information. It tells us about the extent to which we've covered our requirements and our model. So this is kind of the model-driven development uh, workflow. All right, so it kind of uh, puts the uh, bookends on our little story of uh, what we need to do with the test blob or how we can perhaps defeat it. So what did we learn? Uh, Model-based testing, I think, uh, we, I, I would also say it means more better testing. There's lots of reasons that it works well. It provides us with early feedback many kinds of different feedback. It is formal, executable, and traceable. Uh, it gives us a systematic exploration of the state space, uh, both the system under test as well as our understanding. One of the great uh, advantages of modeling is that it helps you to understand what you're thinking as opposed to thinking something and you have it right and then building that and using that as a feedback loop to try to understand your, your concept. And we can get once we've done that, we can get many more better tests. And then model-driven development is kind of an interesting principle, uh, I think, that where we can roll back the testing back blob. 
Because in doing this, we, we maintain and develop the model. We don't maintain and develop the test code. I generated 1,000 tests. I generated them twice. I don't use those tests. I don't work at that level. We maintain the model. We tweak the model. We don't work at the test code level. And that means we can regenerate the test suites on the fly. So this is, uh, you know, th there's, of course, work uh, that has to go into creating models, and there's a lot of other stuff. I don't want to minimize uh, the amount of effort involved. But it does kind of push that uh, testing back blob. It allows you to stay more in that band of kind of keeping track, tracking the forward development of features, as opposed to uh, having to just kind of hope that that blob doesn't uh, eat you alive. So I say, somebody asked me yesterday evening what I was going to talk about, and after thinking about it for a while, I said, um, more models, less tests. So with that, uh, I'm going to say thank you very much for your attention today, and uh, we'll take uh, questions. Um, you mentioned uh, adapters that can adapt to systems... Um are there ways to adapt this to Objective-C and Xcode? Uh, certainly from uh, the, yes. Uh, you would have to provide some kind of interface uh, that was controllable from a, a, a Visual Studio or Microsoft uh, platform executable uh, that could interface. So uh, one way to do it would be to devise some kind of wrapper that uh, accomplished that translation uh, through uh, you know, whatever remote procedure call mechanism you might uh, want to use. Uh, unfortunately, there is no native uh, support, and I'm not aware of any native uh, tools that run in the uh, iOS platform for model-based testing. Uh, it seems as though this Spec Explorer was designed really for an API-based testing you know, framework. Now, you, the adapters seem to have been, you know, passed over, but in the case of, like, Objective-C and Xcode, that's really a, a critical uh, intersection point, you know, for us to actually use some kind of, you know, model-based testing. Is that true that it was more for an API? Sure, well, it was, it was uh, targeted for the Microsoft stack. Just the whole stack, Microsoft. Everything, yeah. And uh, it was also used, uh, not a lot, but it was used to drive uh, other um, systems on other uh, implementations. So what, an example of that uh, was that uh, in the, uh, by the way, this is the Microsoft Open Protocol Project. If you want to read more about it, there's a link to it. Um, in that project, one of the things that we did was to uh, try to demonstrate or provide um, test suites to third parties who were writing interoperable implementations for Microsoft. So for the SMB2 file management system, one of the users of that uh, information was uh, Samba. Samba produced a data appliance that ran on a Linux kernel. So it was a terabyte of storage, and it was basically a little box and it had a Linux real-time kernel in it. But if you uh, plugged in the Ethernet cable into that on a, and looked at it from a, a Windows machine, it looked just like uh, you had a Windows server on the other side. Well, how did that happen? It wasn't magic. Basically, the guys at Saba took the SMB2 protocol and then uh, implemented that whole protocol stack so that it would respond to remote procedure calls in the SMB2 protocol. So uh, can you use this to test? Uh, other kinds of uh, uh, implementations on other stacks, absolutely. Hello. Yeah, go. thanks, Bob, for uh, uh, joining us today. This is a great talk here. Um, so this isn't necessarily uh, specific to uh, this Microsoft tool, but I did notice that the tests uh, were sort of serialized in terms of, if you look at the sequence of operations, suppose you have like a distributed system where you have a certain amount of asynchrony in there and you sort of want to test, you know, certain uh, sort of global state at certain snapshots through the process. Do you know of any of these testing tools that actually, actually can sort of model uh, sort of parallelism or concurrency uh, in the tests themselves? Is this, a, this is a difficult, I found this, 
in, in my experience building distributed systems, this is always this terribly difficult problem of trying to simulate uh, a certain sequence of events that are occurring sort of uh, in parallel. So I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on. Uh, yeah, actually uh, I worked on exactly that problem. We had um, a uh, combination, uh, th there's a, a Microsoft, uh, one of the protocols that I worked on was uh, the DCOM protocol, uh, which had within it uh, two-phase commit. And so uh, it was the Microsoft implementation of two-phase commit uh, across uh, a multiplicity of, of different uh, endpoints. So we were able to generate uh, tests that operated on the different endpoints, and then we had a way of having a single observer. Essentially, when you do that, you have to come back to some kind of single observer point. So the, the test engine essentially ran on that, that single observer point and then interacted with all of those other endpoints that were in the test system. Uh, the model itself you know, <laughs> can get to be ridiculously complex. Uh, we, we tried to keep it as simple as possible uh, and not, not do a very uh, exhaustive type of test, but one that would validate that the at least minimal uh, interaction and interoperability was met. So it's certainly possible. It's, it's not trivial. Second quick question, um, how do these tools typically behave when you have a state space that becomes extremely large? So it looks like what it does is it creates some sort of a DFA um, and, you know, if that state space is, is extremely large, what does it do to sort of find the right sample? Uh, That's up to the modeler. Uh, there are a number of features within uh, this tool and others, I don't want to uh, limit this just to Spec Explorer, uh, by which you can kind of control the uh, so-called state space explosion. One of the things that Spec Explorer has that really is very nice for dealing with that is this idea of machines. So that if you want to just take a slice, a particular slice to get, kind of get from the, the start state to an end state along a particular path, you can define that machine. And then you can explore all the variations in that slice instead of trying to do the entire system, in which you know, it then gets to be a runaway. Uh, there are also uh, limits that you can put in there, kinds of number of iterations or depth of exploration, and just just stop it there. So uh, there's there's no magic here. Uh, something else that you can do with Spec Explorer is you can do a form of model checking. So you can define kind of anti-states or things that you don't want to have happen, and then ask the exploration to see if it can reach that state. There's a question over here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, so one of the challenges, one of the big challenges with our unit testing and so forth is the, and it's like this blob of the, the it becomes more and more fragile as we change requirements and so forth. So I'm going to read into, and I don't think you suggestion is that maintaining the, your model is much closer at, at a higher level of abstraction that track can more easily track the changing requirements and features of your of your uh, process or your application and that is one of the big wins in terms of as your system grows the scalability is that correct is that a correct yes that that's that's correct okay I agree with all that <laughs> okay and the second question does uh, the Having these models, are there uh, techniques to inject um, uh, variances of data? Say, I want to, you know, I want to randomize or uh, Monte Carlo or something like this uh, over over particular data sets and, and domains, so that we can exercise those paths. Or is it just an exhaustive search in that way? Or they they combine. It can be either. Uh, there are, in Spec Explorer and other tools, there, there usually is some kind of data provider or data selection strategy. Uh, so within Spec Explorer, uh, you have, one of the reasons I mentioned that we have data state is that you, it's a kind of up to the modeler to make that decision. Uh, Spec Explorer has the ability to uh, perform uh, a very sophisticated selection in terms of uh, minimal, identifying a minimal size set of combinations over a set of possible variables and values. Uh, so it has a, a nice uh, capability in that regard. Other, other uh, systems do that as well, take a slightly different approach to it. It's worth mentioning, I, I did my, uh, I've written model-based testing tools myself. The first one I did was now oh, about 15 years ago. I rolled it by hand, I wrote it in Prolog. I wrote 30,000 lines of Prolog. Uh, it was uh, one of the most painful experiences in my career. 
I never really got to like prologue much, but I did a lot of it. Uh, maintenance of that really got to be a bear. Um, and one of the things that I learned in doing that was that this question of uh, identifying data, uh, basically uh, searching paths and conditions and then uh, assigning data values to that that made sense for a particular condition and driving that got to be a very complicated problem. And I was kind of going at it from a, a sort of, uh, uh, let's say an ad hoc, sort of pragmatic approach. I did what I could, but then it's like I hit a wall. And what I realized later, and, and what almost everybody else in the model-based testing space has learned, is that that sort of pragmatic approach very quickly runs out of gas. Because the, the problem of selecting over, over a path, selecting a feasible set of uh, values that will drive that path is a non-trivial problem. So all of the testing tools, model-based testing tools today that are both open source or on the market uh, use some form of constraint solver. Constraint solvers are systems that uh, they're, they're a bit, uh, you know, esoteric. Uh, you know, if you're a computer scientist, you'll kind of love what they do. Uh, there's a constraint, there's a constraint solver bake-off every year. It's kind of like these robot wars, only it's for constraint solvers and you know, people huddled over terminals and yelling and screaming at each other. Uh, so they've gotten to be quite sophisticated and quite good. But any model-based testing tools today that do a, a good job of solving this data problem are essentially using a constraint solver of some kind under the hood. So a pragmatic approach to just trying to figure this out and getting smarter and smarter, essentially you paint yourself into a corner very quickly. Question over here. So I'd like to, I like, I, like, I like your statement that you can test the requirements. That's way upstream. Uh, from my, the way I have this framed, a, a, there's a language and language produces sentences and a model is just a, a representation of all those sentences. So we have all these requirements and our system is really a model, attempts to be a model of, of those sentences. Uh, what I'd like to ask is, do you have a simple but non-trivial example of a real situation where you uncovered inc inconsisten inconsistency in requirements using model-based testing? Because I could see this be very easy to do because we keep adding new and new and new requirements. And uh, So I think the short answer is yes. Uh, and the, the somewhat longer answer is that that was the uh, basically, the purpose of this project, uh, without going into a lot of detail on it, uh, the sort of the short story on it is that Microsoft was uh, required by the federal government and the European Union to publish specifications such that uh, third parties could interoperate with their software. Uh, the, the regulatory bodies that insisted on this uh, wanted proof, they wanted evidence that the actual documentation that was produced uh, was usable by third parties for interoperability. One of the ways that uh, we provided that proof to the regulatory agencies was through model-based testing. So that we took the documentation of these 500 APIs and then produced model-based test suites for that documentation such that every requirement or every statement of capability within that document had at least one test. And in that process, we found uh, the, the documentation was written by the test arch the architects and the basically the senior uh, product uh, managers of each of those, those systems and APIs. We found uh, about 50,000 separate requirements bugs. Uh, some of them were fairly trivial and cosmetic. Uh, others were substantive. But the interesting thing was we found about 80% of them doing the modeling before we ever ran any tests. The other 20% were when we actually got the test suites running, ran them against the, the, the uh, real world servers, and found out that uh, the descriptions were not an accurate representation of their behavior. So it was a little bit of an unusual circumstance that we're testing documentation, not software. But that's, that's an example of it, and there are others. Um, any empirical data you have uh, comparing project that's moved from, you know, a traditional TDD model to this kind of a model? So any empirical data in terms of 
Yeah, I did a survey on this uh, about two years ago. <clears throat> it was not an extensive survey, but uh, the you know there the, there are people who uh, have have adopted this. Um, I'd say probably about four out of five would report uh, success. Uh, they typically see gains in productivity and quality. If you'd like to, I, I'd be happy to send you the survey if you're interested. Is there another question, gentlemen, behind you? So, okay. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's like any other kind of uh, sort of um, using a, a different kind of software technology. Uh, you know, you need to be trained in it. Uh, you need to take the time to kind of get up to speed. You've got to allow some time for fumbling around with it and making mistakes first, et cetera, et cetera. All right, I think that's it for the questions. Uh, why don't we all thank Bob for speaking today.